All right, so I'm going to tell you about, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about like our struggles to decide if we want to do something like workflows or like implement things that would be as much trouble as workflows. And so that's what I'll spend some time on and then show you what we've done so far. So first of all, oh, this um, dome-shaped thing overlooking the beautiful Bay Area is the advanced light source. That's the, you know, this acronym ALS. I think yet on Monday you heard about NERSC. That's the supercomputing center at Berkeley Lab. And so that's the two things we're combining is this um, X-ray facility and the supercomputer. So first I'm going to tell you about what is the advanced light source of the ALS. Um, you probably know that X-rays are just light, shorter wavelength than visible light. And a lot of times you, to be able to see something small, you need a wavelength of light that matches that. And so to see, you know, atoms and molecules, a lot of times you're going with x-rays. So that's why you would want to use x-rays, or one of the reasons. There's been 19 Nobel Prizes awarded for x-ray related work through chemistry, physics, and medicine. And if you, you know, probably everybody in this room has had an x-ray before. You know, you go to the dentist, you get an x-ray. You go to the doctor, you get an x-ray. And so, why would you need a special fancy facility for x-rays? You can get them anywhere. Well, the reason is this is a log scale of brightness. You know, the kind of x-rays you would get at the doctor's or the dentist's office is down here. And what you can achieve with uh, a bend, what's called a bending magnet or an undulator at the ALS is just like a lot, a lot brighter. And so to be able to do experiments that like really are fast or really go to high resolution, you want to go to these things called synchrotrons that produce these bright X-ray beams. So this is taking the lid off of the advanced light source to see what's inside. It's a particle accelerator. You start with a linear accelerator, um, and you accelerate bunches of electrons. And then you have a booster ring that accelerates them even faster. The electrons are injected into the storage ring. And as the electrons go through magnetic fields, they produce X-ray beams. And so it's an electron accelerator producing X-ray beams. All right. So there's something like 50 synchrotrons around the world. They're in multiple different countries. There's um, five light sources. There's four synchrotrons in the United States that are run by the Department of Energy, like the advanced light source is one of those. And so this is, you know, the, the advanced light source. It was, um, it actually reused a dome shape that was already being used for something else, but it, they started construction on the ALS in something like 1988. It took first light in 1993. So if you look inside, you know, what mostly what you see is like a lot of concrete and metal and wires. There's a lot of shielding to protect people from the x-rays. Um, and, you know, the other thing you see is like it takes a lot of people to run the place. So we have about a, a staff of about 150 people, um, about 50 scientists. A bunch of electricians, a bunch of engineers, people doing different kinds of things just to make the place work. Um, but it, what the you know what we're there for is to produce all these X-ray beams. So the X-rays shoot down all these different pipes um, called beam lines. So the X-ray beams go in all these different directions, and so we're able to do about forty different experiments simultaneously. So there's 40 different beam lines, and these are the names of all the different beam lines because there's different magnets, there's different characteristics to produce X-rays that are shorter wavelength or longer wavelength with bigger spots or smaller spots, more bright, less bright. So there's all different varieties of X-ray beam lines here. Um, just to give you a little bit of sense of, so it's, it's a user facility. So the, there's 150 staff members who run the place, but most of the experiments that happen there are done by users who come from the outside. They write proposals. The proposals get ranked. You know, only about half the proposals get time, but the ones that do, we, the staff supports them in doing their research. So at any given time, we have 50 to 100 users on site doing experiments. The typical stay ranges from an hour to 10 days. So people come, you know, at the in instrument I run, people are usually there for one or two days. Um, and they come from a lot of different funding sources and many different disciplines. So from earth and environmental, applied, chemical, life, physical, material sciences. There's like a broad range of different science that happens. Um, so I just wanted to like b quickly go through a few of these different areas of science. So there's there were a lot of COVID research. So this is at, uh, this one was from Beamline 422. We number our beamlines. This is a structural biology beamline or protein crystallography, you might call it. 
and they were looking at the structure of the spike protein and various antibodies to develop antibody treatments for COVID. So that's, there's a lot of structural biology that happens. Um, there, you know, we have a scattering beamline, what's called SAXWAX, small angle X-ray scattering and wide angle X-ray scattering. They do lots of stuff, including looking at membranes. This beamline 801 is doing resident inelastic X-ray scattering. They do a lot of work on batteries and redox states. Um, this is from 932 ambient pressure X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. That look, do a lot looking at surfaces. Uh, including for, you know, lithium surface reactions. So then we have a lot of imaging beam lines. So this is 701 um, coherent scattering and microscopy. And they're able to look at, you know, the structure as well as the strain and composition of cathode materials. So now this is the one that I work at. It's uh, um, what's called micro CT. We do 3D imaging at like micron resolution. We're able to do time resolve things. And so this is uh, you know, an, a 3D image of a small piece of a battery where there's lithium metal, a separator, and graphite. And the researchers, by looking at different charging rates, were able to see that at that high charging rate, you get some lithium plating, which present, prevented the rest of the battery from being used, um, you know, as you would like it to. So this is four other images from um, my beam line. This is a ceramic that's a part of a jet engine. This is shale from a place where they do hydraulic fracturing. This is a piece of heat shield from the NASA Mars lander. And this is a piece of a grapevine from uh, UC Davis looking at water transport and drought in agriculture. So what I'm trying to get across so far is that you use x-rays for a lot of different things and uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so, um, and that's gonna be, you know, part of what motivates my talk about the workflows we use. So, do you want to x-ray something? So send us a proposal. It's really easy. A rapid access proposal is one page. You can get a few hours of, of time to scan something. Generally use both three pages. These are, um, there was a middle school who wanted to scan something. So these are, uh, they sent a proposal and I helped them scan an eggshell, some Mentos, pre and post Diet Coke, and a butterfly wing. So, uh, so it's easy. Um, all right. So let me talk about some changes that we've been seeing over the last while that are leading us to want to use workflows more. Um, so <laughs> I got this, I, I asked my, um, my, my the person who hired me and who just retired last year, I asked him for the, his version of the history of synchrotrons. And he said, well, in the 1980s, basically we had these accelerators, there's a hole in the wall, the x-rays came out, and like the users had to come and bring everything else. <laughs> we gave them just x-rays and nothing else. And then, you know, over time, we started to like provide more things. We started to provide, okay, well maybe we'll give you like a motor to move the sample and we'll give you a detector and we'll help you run that. And so then that was, that sort of allowed us to get more users in. So then the next step, you know, is in the 20, in the last 10 years, definitely it's been a big deal is adding more computing. We're adding data infrastructure, networking, things like that. So then I think what's coming next is like just adding more brains, like the whole AI ML thing, just adding brains everywhere. So that's the direction we've been going. And part of the reason that the fa facilities like us are pushing to do those kinds of things are to expand our user community. Because if you, if you don't provide these things, it's, things are so complicated <laughs> these days that it's hard for a brand new user who's never come and done this kind of experiment. It's really hard for them to make use of it but it's really important for us because we're such expensive facilities. It's really important for us to attract a large community of users. So we feel like we really need to provide the tools and capabilities that let people be successful when they come to us. So let me just mention a few other things that are driving you know, what we're doing. Data drivers, like the, uh, this is like the Moore's Law curve with an exponent, you know, log scale. Detectors are increasing in their data rates exponentially. Synchrotron brightness has been increasing more than exponentially, or more than Moore's law. And um, you know, there's also a lot of robotics happening. So all these things are letting us create data a lot faster. The other thing that we're seeing happening is a lot of really cool developments in computing, algorithms, and software. And so the thing that, for me personally, really like, made me excited about wanting to use the supercomputer and integrate it in my workflow was this um, work here. So this, this group led by Charlie Bauman and Xiao Wang, they're at Purdue, 
And they were, um, I guess there's this thing called the Gordon Bell Prize at Supercomputing. Um, and they, were they didn't win it, but they were finalists for this prize. And the way they did it was by doing this uh, model-based iterative reconstruction, which basically, in this test, they used the entire NERSC supercomputer to do like a really fancy reconstruction. You know, you can do tomographic reconstructions with much simpler algorithms that you can just run on your desktop, no problem. But what they showed was that using this fancy algorithm that requires like this huge supercomputer, they could actually get much better results. And I was like, wow, I need, I need that. <laughs> and my users need that. So I need to like make it happen that like my data goes there and that we, at least even if not every user is doing that, I want them to have access to that. So that's really what motivated me. There's been a bunch of developments in uh, machine learning, obviously. This is one example from data from my beam line. So this is a, a starch-based pellet. Um, and if you take 1,024 angles as we rotate the sample and take images, you can reconstruct something that looks like this. If you take 128 angles, you get something that looks like this. So it's the same data set. And so you just train your model and say, if I give you this, you give me that. <laughs> and then, you know, when you're, the reason we do this is that we're microwaving this thing and watching it poof up. And so you don't, don't actually have time to collect as many angles as you want because you need to go really fast. So in the, during the real experiment, you only collect a few angles and then you know, the, mod, the, the machine learning can help you. There's a lot of other machine learning uh, applications. This is the ceramic matrix composite that's part of a jet engine. It's made up of a, a bunch of fibers. And using feature detection and computer vision things, you know, we can detect every individual fiber and detect where the fibers break when we're pulling this thing apart. So there's an experiment where we heat the sample up to over 1,000 degrees while we're pulling it apart. So we're watching individual fibers break, and then the whole matrix breaks, and the whole thing pulls apart. And we want to sort of investigate exactly when do the fibers break, how is that all working together with the crack. So um, OK, so to, to sort of sum up what's going on, I've got this plot. This is a little bit hand wavy, but I worked with um, some colleagues at a similar uh, instrument at the Swiss Light Source to put together this plot. So we were looking at. How much of our users' time is spent managing and analyzing their data versus planning the experiment and actually collecting the data? <laughs> and what we're seeing is that like from 2000 to 2020, like the amount of time that people are spending actually like doing the experiment is like nothing. And like all their time is spent doing the data analysis. And honestly, in many cases, just like the pure data management, copying data back and forth, loading a big data set into like whatever software they're doing. It's just like really painful for them. And so the problem though is, so like I think if any, any user you ask who comes and does experiments is going to be like, please give me more help with like the data analysis and management. But the problem is that um, it's hard for any one of those individual people to be motivated to like build a fancy workflow tool or a big data management system. And here, this is like, again, a little bit hand wavy, but if you think about how much work it is to build a fancy like workflow tool that has all these features in it that's robust and, and works for everything, you know, it takes a lot of development time. And then, you know, that, so in, this, in these plots, I'm putting human time, which is like how much time it takes to like use the system and do your data processing versus development time, which is how much it takes to develop the system to begin with. And I'm, again, like using a hand wavy uh, saying like there's the big data approach, which has workflows and monitoring. And then there's the small data approach, which is like a graphical interface and you're like double clicking things. And so, you know, the small data approach it like never gets any easier and it takes a lot of human time, but the development time isn't, <laughs> is small. And so for, if you look at like, you know, uh, how, how many samples you have, like if you only have 10 or even 100 samples, it's like really hard to like justify putting all the development time in. But that's why, you know, basically for most individuals, they're like, okay, I got 10 samples, I got 100 samples, I'll just survive. I'm not going to do it. But like from the perspective of the facility, we see this happening every single day. And so for us, it's like we've got like, I guess we're going to be the ones that take responsibility for building, you know, some of these tools that will help people. Um, OK, so this is now getting into uh, some of our, uh, our, our, our stuff. And <laughs> I put this little thing. Um, I actually was going back through some old talks I gave. and. Um, 
I saw a talk I gave in 2015 when this guy named Craig Toll, who I was working with at the time, he's a computing guy, originally from high energy physics. And I made this slide, and I originally titled this slide, Micro CT Workflow. And he saw it, and he's like, that's not a workflow. <laughs> I'm like, well, what do I call it? He's like, I don't know, but it's not a workflow. And I'm like, OK, so we decided to call it an analysis chain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, so I, I've been really, I've really enjoyed this workshop because it's like, uh, you know, opened my mind to new meanings of workflow. So thank you to all of you <laughs> for all of your different workflows. So let me tell you about our analysis chain. So you have a sample. In our case, for tomography, you rotate the sample. You take images from different angles. So you collect your raw data. You save your raw data. You do a tomographic reconstruction to get a 3D volume. You often filter and segment the data to like pick out different parts of the data that you want to analyze. So you, and then you do these feature identification. Then you might do a model development where you create a model of that. And then you might do a simulation. So in this case, it's a, a, woven, fiber, uh, a woven textile made out of ceramics. And you want to understand how strong it is when you pull it apart. So you want to end up with a simulation of that. But there's all these steps along the way. So the. If you, so this is one kind of sample. Remember, we're, you know, at one of the 40 beam lens we have at our facility, one of the many samples is this one. And this is like the, the chain of analysis for that sample. But if you're looking at like the shale rock or the plant or the insect or the tooth that we scan, you know, the, the, the analysis chain might look very different. And so, as you go along the steps in the analysis chain, the different kinds of situations we need to cover just like ex explodes. And so that, I think, is part of the reason why if you look at, so this is a, a plot I made of the number of users who reach that stage versus like the stage along the analysis chain. So like newbie users, we give them the tomographic reconstruction, and that's sort of like where they stop. <laughs> then they take those home, and they look at the pictures, and they just like take a screenshot of the picture, put it in the paper, and that's sort of where, like, where they get to. Um, and then you know, a lot of users get to this point of like f filtering, segmenting maybe, and some feature identification. And then it's only the most power users who are getting all the way to these fancy simulations and things like that. Yes? I think I'm just missing a point. So is, is the issue that? This is not a workflow because it's not complicated enough, or it's not automated enough, or what's the? Uh, no, I, I, sorry, I, I don't, I didn't mean to get, get caught up on what's a workflow and what's not a workflow. I was just, that was just like a memory I had that I wanted to share. It just seems like the word workflow is, is what you're describing. Yes, I agree. I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to share my like uh, my trauma from like having been <laughs> that what I'm doing is not workflows, but that's all right. <laughs> um, okay, uh, and I yeah, I'm happy to talk more about that another time. So um, when I think about what the different users in these different places want, like the newbie users are just like, help, I, I don't know, you know, I'm brand new, I've never done this before, I just need help. The people in the middle, they, you know, they basically feel like, there's all these different software to do this analysis. It's running on different platforms. I'm switching my data between different things in different formats. It's just like hard. Could I, I could just do so much more if things were in one place running on a supercomputer. And then there's the power users who like, they're like, I, I'm only going to use my own code. Don't, I, I hate the framework you chose. Like, <laughs> stay away from me. So, and that's fine too. Um, they don't need my help. Um, so, you know, what we are, Hope what you know what as we've over the last like five or six years been trying to design more sophisticated workflows. We've been hoping that we'll be able to get you know all those people just shifted a little bit more along the line. And so the you know the the thing that we've latched onto to do this is this super facility model that Debbie talked about on Monday, where you're combining the capabilities that we provide as an X-ray facility, but also combining Things like mathematics from camera, the hardcore computing provided by places like NERSC, the ridiculously fast network provided by ESNet, and of course, like all the great ideas brought by the user community. So this super facility is like what we've really tried to cho choose and invest in as like a path forward to succeed. So I want to um, now talk about like some of the workflows we're using from different perspectives. And so first. I wanted to show the, uh, our computing group's perspective. 
And <laughs> it's basically diagrams. And so let me skip this one and look at this one. And so from our computing group's perspective, they have chosen this workflow manager called Prefect, which I'll talk, tell you a little bit more about in a little. Um, so we have a Beamline acquisition computer that's connected to our cameras. It sends the data over, or, or the, it notifies when the data instead is collected, it notifies the server, uh, the workflow server, which then launches data movement. And you know we move the data to cert different servers, we move the data to NERSC, and then we can like launch processing jobs as well through this through this workflow manager. So it's sort of like a central place that orchestrates data movement, orchestrates data processing, and keeps track of what's going on. And then we also, it also launches ingest of the data into a database. So um, this is the, you know, the ALS computing group's perspective on what our, what's happening with our workflow. I wanted to show a little bit more from a user perspective because for them, they don't sort of care what's happening under the scenes. They just care about like how they're interacting with the data. So I wanted to show you just a little video uh, that goes quickly through. Um, let's see. Hopefully this plays. So ALS Hub is like our website where people log in to submit proposals. And so what we've done is we've made this landing page there, takes them to a place that um, gives them remote access to our computers through a web interface. So they can click in. And they can, you know, access our data acquisition remotely. This is for our remote users. Then they choose. Uh, they have a place where they can choose the when they're starting data collection. They choose their username. And this queries our um, proposal database. It it populates all the metadata about them and their proposal. They click go. The data collection starts. The, on the right is the. This is going too fast. Hold on. Uh, let me just go back here. Okay. So I think you saw. OK, so this is the real image in the, just with an iPhone and then the x-ray image. This is a screenshot of our, um, our workflow, of like the web interface to our workflow manager. So the, it has this web portal where you can sort of monitor things and see how things are going, if there's a problem, follow up on it. So this is showing all of the individual data sets that have gone through and gotten transferred. Uh, sorry, oh no. Spoiling it. <laughs> OK. Let's go to here. Sorry. So yeah, in this, and then for the workflow manager, you can click on any individual dot and see like there's a log of exactly what happened to that data set. Um, in this case, we're transferring the data set to, AL, to ALS servers and to NERSC, so it's checking on that. This is a, the, a, the web portal for our, our database, where you can have searchable access to all the data sets that have gotten collected. You know, users only get access to their data, but there's also like a record of all the metadata for that data set, so it's all searchable. One of the, uh, okay, so then this is the data processing system we have on NERSC. Again, we've got chosen to go with Jupyter, and so the data gets to NERSC, users log into jupyter.nurse.gov, and we give them template notebooks that let them analyze their data. So without having to install anything or do anything, they suddenly have access to like high performance computing. And also, you know, we've embedded some widgets and things like that to make it so that they can see their results, see what's going on, and it's all through a web browser. And then once they're done and they want to download the data sets to their home institution, we've set up Globus, and so they log into Globus and download all of that. We're also developing this thing called ML Exchange. This is a web-based segmentation app where you paint, you say, okay, like that's the background, you paint another color, this is my grass. Uh, this is still the grass, there's a cross section through the grass sample. You're like, I wasn't happy with, I, I want to have more background just to make sure you got it. And then, you know, there's all these different machine learning models you can choose from, and you click train, it trains it, um, and it, you know, learns what's what, and then it, you know, segments your whole data set for you and, and basically blocks off everything that's grass and everything that's not grass. And then we take it over to this other, um, you know, widget from ITK that lets you do both 2D and 3D visualizations. So you can scroll through your whole data set and then in 2D, but also like in 3D, you can have, you know, uh, this visualization of your data um, to do, you know, to be able to do different things. So, um, 
So, those, so from a user's perspective, what we've tried to build is this whole set of web-based tools so that they can like interact with their data at each point along the way. Behind the scenes, the you know, workflow management software is putting the data in the correct places, giving access to people to the right data sets so that they only see their own data and things like that. So um, now let me just say a little bit about my perspective on, the, uh, on our workflow. So this is like Doula 2015, how I felt about the super facility. It's all rainbows and unicorns. It's amazing. This is going to be great. Um, so this is, there, you know, there's got to be some reality checks sometimes. So I, I got this text yesterday, like yesterday afternoon. Hi, Dula. So the Perlmutter was faulting during, Perlmutter is the name of the super, one of the computers at NERSC. So the Perlmutter was faulting during our beam time. So we were doing everything locally. Now we wonder how we put the data on Nzerg. Um, so when I get, you know, based on my past experience now, because I get, you know, a lot of these messages because our facility runs 24 hours a day and on weekends. <laughs> and so things happen. And based on my past experience, like it, this text um, doesn't tell me actually that Perlmutter's down. Per per Perlmutter's probably not down. <laughs> it could be like anything from like the acquisition system to our ZoomQ streamer to our file writer our workflow orchestrator, the Globus Transfer, the network, spin on nurse, Jupyter on nurse, CFS on nurse, Perlmutter, compute nodes, data permission settings, or user error. Like one of those things is happening. <laughs> and the downside to having set up such a sophisticated system is that there's like a lot of things that can break and there's different people I have to go to for each of those, whether it's like the ALS compute group or the controls group, or lab IT, or NERSC. And so it, um, it can be a little bit challenging to track down our problems. And so that's like a downside. But um, dis, you know, despite that, I still you know, have, like, it's still worth it, I would say. But um, because there's these problems, it's, you know, as, as we as a facility at the ALS are looking to expand out the use of these kinds of sophisticated workflows, there's definitely a good amount of resistance from people who are scared of not having full control over every part of the workflow. So it's a scary thing to like collaborate with people and rely on other people on these sophisticated workflows. So I think from my perspective, that's like the biggest impediment to you know, really having adoption of, these, of more of these tools at more instruments where I am is because people just want to have control over everything. And so they'd rather have less capability with more control than like more capability with less control. Uh, yeah. At this point with the supercomputers, does any of this really need a supercomputer? Like, can you not just have a local computer? So that's, that's what I tried to emphasize at the beginning, which is that like, yes, you can do a lot of stuff without a supercomputer. Uh, there's definitely some algorithms that like you want to super like that you're you're using a lot. So that was like the my reference to the Gordon, Gordon Bell Prize finalists where they were doing the algorithm. So is there anything that you showed us here that actually requires real? No. So like all of the stuff that um, all of the stuff I showed in the last five minutes is does not require a supercomputer. But the so the the reason though from so from my perspective so and also I should mention that like. We actually have like a lot of the stuff that I showed that runs on NERSC, we actually also have backups. So I'm, I'll say in my next slides, we're using Docker containers. We can run it on NERSC. We can run it wherever, right? But like the reason that we've taken the trouble to design it to be able to work on NERSC is because it's really important to us to allow people the chance to use those more advanced algorithms. Um, not everybody wants to, but like we want to build it so that they can. Do you have an example? Like this, this all just seems like something to be on a, on a laptop next to the instrument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so the, uh, I mean, we can, we can, we can, uh, you know, happy to talk about more examples in detail after. But like the, so the like model-based iterative reconstruction. That's a, like much more, you know, beefy uh, reconstruction. And you know, many people. So. One of the things uh, is that like, it, not every data set needs that or is going to benefit from that. A lot of people don't even want it. And so again, like it's, but like we want it to be possible for these 
you know, a lot of times a new user comes in, they don't even know what they want, right? They, they, they reach out to us, they know that they want to do imaging, they know they want to do something. And so we want to, you know, going back to, um, sort of this thing, we want to make, you know, the, the new people, we just want to do a little bit more, but the people, you know, everybody else, we want to like give them the next level of capabilities. And there, you know, so some people we want to shift over to be able to do these big simulations. So there's like Puma, like we have this code called Puma, which basically once you have a 3D image, you're doing a full scale simulation of stuff flowing through your sample. So like the NASA sample, for example, that's what they want to do. It's like not just getting a 3D reconstruction, it's then doing the simulations that are using that as a basis. I don't know if that is helpful. Well, I guess I'm just, you know, so I've, I've been only one data beam like, but I know the pressure to get the data was huge. The last thing you want is something to go down or yeah. you can do all the analysis later, right? So, uh, I mean, yes and no. Um, the, one of the things that we're, one of the things that we find is that, so, you know, I'm not focusing in my talk today on like real time analysis or autonomous experimentation that requires the big computer. But I mean, we also want this infrastructure to allow that. And so, I mean, yes and no. So like, certainly, like I mentioned, we have fallbacks all at the ALS where you can like do the simpler stuff at the ALS. In many cases that is enough. But like one of the problems we run into is that for in some cases, when you're wanting to use a more sophisticated algorithm, it's because you want to do the experiment in a fundamentally different way. For example, you want to collect much less data, knowing that your algorithm is going to be able to deal with that much less data and still give you the results you want. But if you don't, if you have, if you, if you have someone who only gets to come to the synchrotron once in the year, and it's their only chance, it feels very risky to them <laughs> to be, to, to collect data with, in that way without having some assurance right away that it's working. So that's like one of the reasons that we want to have just like NERSC there, you know, part of our pipeline so that like as soon as possible you can just like do the analysis. So, I mean, yes, like the <laughs> there's, argu you know, there's arguments pro and con. Uh, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. So, you know, when I, um, the first time I went to a workshop, and talked about doing, connecting the light source and the supercomputer. Like there were a bunch of people in the room who basically shouted me down and told me that it was the dumbest thing ever. So I've, I've been like, <laughs> I'm, I've been in this situation for the last like eight years, many, many times. And like, that's fine. Um, the, I guess I've been happy that NERSC itself has sort of come around to my perspective, and like that's why they made the super facility project to engage with experimental facilities like the ALS to be able to do this kind of thing. So I may not be explaining it perfectly, <laughs> but somebody's convinced that it's a good idea. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me just go through. Okay, so let me just emphasize some of the things that we've built into our workflows and why we've done it that way. So we've really gone all in on web interfaces. That's because there's no installation for the users, no computer requirements for users beyond their laptop. And um, you know, remote participants in the experiments can use the same interface as the people at the beam lines. Um, we've gone all in on Docker, and I guess at NERSC it's called Shifter, but it's like these Docker containers so that we can basically set up all of the software in an environment and then run it either at the ALS or at NERSC or wherever else. And, you know, we, there's some nice things that uh, we've worked with NERSC on, for example, scripts to launch the Docker container so that like we create the mappings of the folders and things so that people just see their data and it's like a very clean interface for them. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to make it so we have these loosely coupled components. So if something breaks, that's okay. Everything else still works. Um, we've got this prefect or uh, workflow orchestration. The reason we chose prefect is because there's a large community with industry backing that makes it, like including like financial companies and at least one other light source. 
has a lot of tools for easy monitoring and notifications and retries and flexible, you know, it's flexible to hook up different compute to it. Um, we've tried to have, you know, work towards interoperable metadata, like the, we've, we've done the work to figure out the file form, like stand, some standard file formats, like Nexus is a very common file format at light, at light sources around the world. So we've moved over our data writing to, you know, be written in those data formats that have all this metadata. Um, you know, this is the, the specific file format that I'm using that's used across multiple light sources. We have information embedded in our, we're using HDF5 files, that's the package for Nexus. And we have information about users, experiments, and data processing. Um, the, I guess the thing that's for us been still the most painful when working across light sources, uh, or sorry, working across different computing systems is dealing with the different security requirements, different accounts, different passwords. You know, this weekend, the thing that went wrong is the certificate expired on one of the servers that holds our APIs. And so like the APIs stopped working. And uh, so just keeping like all that infrastructure going is sort of the painful thing. So in conclusion, um, I would, so I would argue that the need for workflows is increasing and more people are open to doing the work to adopt them. Um, there's a few good examples that exist that are promising. There's still a lot of work to do to make them easy to deploy and robust across all the different beam lines. And, um, you know, the infrastructure we build for workflows will be useful for autonomous, autonomous experiments and other sort of fancier things if you, you know, if you need that. And uh, thanks to, you know, ALS and LBL computing groups uh, and all the NERSC people who helped make all of this happen. Thanks. <laughs>